My name's Daryl. Um, as you may be able to tell, I'm from Scotland, so if that causes any problems, sorry about that. Um, I'm a senior data scientist at Futurist. Uh, I've been with the company for about a year. Before that, I was a machine learning academic. And this is a talk about hype. Um, and more particularly, it's a talk about how to cut through hype and um, try and explain a bit about what these things mean. Like AI, big data, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. Like there's a lot of language around this and people use different terms interchangeably when they probably shouldn't use those terms interchangeably. Um, so it would be impossible to explain all of that in one 25 minute talk. So I'm gonna focus on these kind of two questions. What is, so what does machine learning actually do? What's it for? And um, if I have a problem, how do I know this is a problem that I should solve using machine learning? Um, and I spe specifically say machine learning there because artificial intelligence is a term that has a lot of baggage. Like if I say artificial intelligence, how many of you think of like Skynet or like insert evil AI from a movie here? Um, but I'm here to tell you that that's not it. Like that's really far away from what we can do right now. Um, so AI, machine learning are, they're tools basically. Artificial intelligence, like I said, is this kind of high level nebulous, no one quite knows what it means term, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna say that artificial intelligence is when you use a computer system to substitute or um, replace some human behavior uh, in some task or set of tasks. Um, and that's like not a useful definition. It's just too big, too broad to really uh, get anywhere with. So machine learning is where I'm focusing this talk. And machine learning is kind of a subset of artificial intelligence techniques. And it's, um, think, think of it like a toolbox. It's just a bunch of different algorithms and uh, techniques from mostly mathematics and statistics uh, that are primarily concerned with learning rules from data. So you use machine learning to solve a single, like to use, to implement AI, to create some human-like behavior in a single well-defined task that you can express using mathematics and then you can solve. And like what that looks like in practice, there are many different kinds of machine learning algorithms. There's thousands at this point, but for the ones that people are actually using out in the world and you know making money with in their businesses, probably the most common type of question that you can answer is uh, given it, like some situation A, tell me something some outcome associated with that situation. And that's, again, totally unhelpful. Like, situations and outcomes doesn't mean anything. So let's go straight to an example so I can maybe clarify a bit what I mean. Self-driving cars are a lot of, are, are in the news a lot in, the, in recent years. Um, you know, Google are doing it, Uber are trying to do it. Tesla have already have some like autopilot features in their cars and they're bringing out full autonomy at some point soon TM. Um, so self-driving cars have to do a lot of different things. They have to turn the wheel, they have to brake, they have to accelerate, they have to like not kill people, uh, they have to park. Like there's many, many tasks, but we could focus um, as, a, as a simple example of a, one of the problems they have to solve on the steering problem. Like here's the road, don't crash. Um, so again, that's a narrow, like, well-defined question that you can set up. It's not just like drive a car. It's given the road or a picture of the road. This is what we can see right now. Tell me how I should turn the wheel to not crash. That's that's the kind of thing that a machine learning problem is. Like, given a situation, predict an outcome. Uh, and this has been done. Like, um, I mean, obviously it's been done because there's lots of self-driving cars coming out. But I think the first people who did this successfully were Carnegie Mellon University, uh, which is in Pittsburgh in the States, if you don't know it. And they did this, and they had this car, it's called Ralph. And it drove 3,000 miles from Pittsburgh to San Diego. And Ralph was in control of the wheel like 98% of the time. There was a human sitting in the car for like not getting arrested reasons, but also to, to operate the pedals. Like Ralph could only control the wheel, he didn't do all the other stuff. Um, and the human had to like actually grab the wheel and take over the driving some 2% of the time, usually like tricky intersections for the most part. 
But, you know, 3,000 miles, 98%, like that's a long way for a car to drive by itself. But maybe, at least for me, like one of the most impressive things about this is that these guys did this in 1995, which you can definitely tell from those shirts. Like, um, so yeah, it was just, they had this big station wagon, they had a laptop, they had a webcam that sat on the dash, and they filmed the road, and um, Ralph told them the correct steering wheel angle. And to train that system, they had to get data. And data, in this case, is just really easy to create because you just drive around in your car, you film the road, you measure what the angle is of the wheel for the human driver, and then eventually you teach the machine how to replicate the human's behavior. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. Like, find a situation, find an outcome you want to predict, specify the problem narrowly. But that doesn't really tell us, like, most of you, I mean, some of you might be in the self-driving car business, I don't know, but I guess most of us aren't. So how to, how to find a problem that's actually worth applying machine learning to um, in your own business, in your own life? Um, so there's been a lot written on this subject. I'm going to go straight to, to a quote. Um, who's heard of Andrew Ng? Decent number. Um, Andrew Ng is a professor of machine learning at Stanford University. He was until recently the head of Internet at Baidu, which is a, like this giant Chinese internet company. He sits on the board of a bunch of different AI startups. He created the first machine learning online course. He's like, he's a guy, he's like a big guy in machine learning. And he was writing this article in the Harvard Business Review and he said that if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI. That's a fairly bold claim. Um, he might well be right. Um, but the question is, is that a good enough rule? Like, less than one second of thought, slam the machine learning in there, let's do it. Like, is, is that how we should be applying it? And I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I think the answer is no. I think there are plenty of problems that you can solve in less than one second of thought that someone can just write a simple computer program to do. Like, you don't have to use machine learning. Machine learning is, you know, it's, it can be slow. It can be kind of a iterative process to get it right. Uh, it can be expensive. Um, like, there are plenty of problems that fit that criteria, but that don't need machine learning at all. So when I like worked with a client and tried to figure out like what are the problems that we should be trying to solve with machine learning, I try to go for like maybe these rules of thumb. So you might have a machine learning problem if it's a problem where the rules are hard. Because if you can just write down the steps one by one how you would solve the problem and tell that to a computer, you've written the program, right? You don't need to do machine learning. So machine learning is only useful when the rules are hard to explain. Uh, are hard to formulate as a program. But at the same time, not all problems with hard rules can be solved with machine learning because sometimes it's really hard to get examples of the behavior you want the computer to do. And if any of you have ever read like a machine learning paper from like the past 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years, um, you've probably seen some variation on this question. Is this a cat? And like, I hope you'll agree that you, this fits the Andrew Ng criteria. Like, you can judge in less than a second that that's a cat. But hopefully you'll also agree that it fits my criteria. Um, writing down the rules for catness of an image are like pretty tough, because the cat could be wrapped in paper. The cat could be facing away from the camera. The cat could be s somewhere in the corner. There can be a bunch of other stuff in the image. Um, and like, enumerating all those situations and writing down an algorithm that takes an arbitrary image and says cat, yes or no, is super hard. But the internet is kind of this elaborate machine that produces cat pictures. So it's like super easy to get data and thanks to like, you know, Google's efforts, like also that, that data is tagged. Um, like, you know, you search for cats and you can just like find thousands, hundreds of thousands of images that are cats. So you can just throw those at the machine learning technique of your choice. That's not strictly true, but you can use machine learning to figure out some kind of rules, like, is this a cat? Um, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, because 
there's still another question here, like, is knowing the rules for Katniss an actual useful proposition for your business? And I would guess that for most businesses, it's probably not. I mean, I guess maybe you run a startup that makes cat doors that only let in specific cats. Maybe then there's some kind of business model there. But in general, like, that's not an actually useful problem to solve because you can't do anything about it after you've figured out there's, there is or there is not a cat in this image. Um, so I'm going to amend the list of rules that I had a minute ago uh, and say that that making a prediction, like solving a machine learning problem is useless unless based on the prediction that you make, you can actually take an action. Like, um, like machine learning doesn't, it's not magic. Like it's, it's just a set of tools for solving problems and you still need the kind of the design process. Like you have to figure out given a business, what are its problems? What are the problems that are actually worth solving? And only then can you like kind of look at the data you have and the, the, the problems that exist in your organization and then figure out if machine learning is actually useful for you. But again, this is still very kind of nebulous talk. Um, so let's drill down a bit and think about some specific examples of stuff that machine learning can do. And I'm going to kind of broadly group the application areas into three. Um, this is by no means comprehensive. Like I've left out a whole massive chunk of the machine learning literature. Um, I've left out stuff like if you if you follow Google's announcements about they've taught this computer to play Go by itself, that's not covered by any of these three categories. Um, but these are kind of the ones that are if not mainstream, then approaching mainstream. These are the ones where people are like using them in actual like money generating businesses. So prediction, personalization, and recognition. So prediction. And by that, I mean basically what I said before. Given a, given a situation, predict something about the future. And there's many different kinds of things that you might want to predict. So like one obvious thing is a number. Um, there's a question like, uh, given all the history of stock changes, uh, stock trades, of given all the history of like you know social networking buzz of um, company press releases, like all kinds of data could go into this. But the kind of given all of that context, a question you might want to ask is, what's the price of this stock tomorrow? And again, if you know much about the financial markets, you probably know that a huge amount of like modern stock exchanges, like the trades that go on are increasingly handled by the machines, like making these predictions and buying and selling from each other, like hundreds or thousands of times per second. And I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, that's like vaguely terrifying. <laughs> like every time I put my money into a bank, I know that there's like someone on the other end who's taking my money and investing it, but it's not someone anymore. It's like an army of boxes that are just like talking to other boxes and somehow that creates money and it kind of blows my mind sometimes. So that's, you can predict numbers. Another thing you might want to do is predict the answer to a yes or no question. So um, there's a picture of a, the wheel of a train. And the question I might want to know is, given some sensors that I have built into the wheel or built into the tracks, um, is this wheel going to fail in the next day, week, month, whatever time scale I'm interested in? Um, and that allows the train companies to only replace the wheels that look like they're about to fail. Like historically, train companies have just changed all the wheels on all the trains uh, every X months or X miles. Um, but by doing this, they only replace the ones that actually need replacing, and that allows them to save like huge amounts of money. Like up to a third of the maintenance work can be cut by doing this. Uh, and more broadly, you can answer other kind of yes/no questions where you choose between like two options. And the kind of obvious generalization of choosing between two options is choosing between more than two options. Um, so like call centers do this. Whenever you call into someone, they look at your number, they look at your account history, um, and they try to figure out what you're calling about and work out where to direct your call before it ever gets answered. Um, I don't know how well that works. Like you've probably called a call center in the past and had some frustrating experiences. 
But for call centers, this, there's value in this because they can uh, like, w like reduce the amount of time wasted transferring calls around between departments. So more, people spend more of their time answering calls that they're actually qualified to answer. So that's prediction. That's like one of the big use cases. That's, uh, there's a lot of applications that kind of fall under this kind of formulation of the machine learning problem. The second one, or the second category, uh, is personalization. And maybe these should be in the other order because probably when a new company like looks to get into the machine learning world, often the first thing they're going to do is try and do some personalization, tailor something about their services to either a specific user or specific groups of users. And the kind of obvious thing to go to is is content recommendation. So, like almost every business has content. Um, content can be like actual products that you sell in a store. It can be videos, it can be written articles. Um, for Google, like most of their money comes from serving ads to people. Like so Google's content is ads. And the kind of unifying thing about all these different types of content is that different people care about different parts of the content to different extents. So there's a lot of value in recommending stuff to people. So that they buy more, so that they keep using your service, so they have a good experience every time they go through your your system. Um, and in some way you can think about recommendation as having this big list of like all the possible content in the world and you sort it to a particular user or user group. But the other thing you might want to do if you have a big giant list of content is only show certain parts of it to, to certain people. Um, so this gets done a lot in kind of marketing applications like given what I know about this user, what are they likely to click on the links in this particular advert email that I sent. Um, and if, like, if Amazon just blasted every single email campaign to every single user, they would very quickly have no users. So there's a lot of like value in only sending the emails to the people who are going to care about them. So these are the two kind of major themes in personalization of recommending content and of targeting content. Kind of saying like, well, you like this versus will, we, will I show you this at all? Um, yeah, that's prediction, personalization. And the last one that I mentioned was recognition. And this is about finding information and from an input source. And that's again, there's a lot of vague terms in this talk. But what I mean by input source are things like images. So face recognition, which you're going to hear more about in the next talk. There's plenty of stuff. Uh, there's plenty of like applications for not just recognizing faces, but you know, recognizing different objects, cats. Um, so that's one input source that you can recognize stuff from. Another one that's important is sound. Um, like Amazon, uh, Google, Apple, most of the big internet companies, I guess, have one of these voice assistants, Alexa, Siri, whatever. Um, so for you to interact with that, they have to be able to understand what you're saying and translate that into um, actions that the machine can understand. Um, so sound recognition is like a huge area of research in machine learning and in industry. Um, beyond things like Siri, there's um, Shazam, I think is the name of the app. Uh, they do song recognition, like you hold your phone up to a song that's playing and tells you who's by. They show you some ads, I guess that's how they make money. Um, they let you buy the album. Uh, all that stuff. But again, that's made possible um, by applications of machine learning to sound. Um, and then the signal that you recognize stuff from uh, might also be text. Like there's been a big, a lot of buzz about chatbots in recent years. I don't know how much of it is warranted. Like a lot of companies seem to want to have a chatbot just because other companies have chatbots. I don't know. I don't understand. But Again, if you want to do it, if you want to have these conversational interfaces, you need to be able to parse text into something that the machine can understand and then like change the machine's output back into text that looks like a conversation to the human on the other end. Um, and again, that's all machine learning driven. Like lots, of pro lots of techniques and lots of work has been done on processing text and extracting meaning and value and information from it. So that's kind of kind of a whirlwind tour of the sort of things that people are doing with machine learning that, that generate money. 
And I think in a lot of these applications, we're not just replacing someone. Um, like in a self-driving car, maybe the, the, the example I started with, there you're actually trying to like fully replace a human behavior. Like I mentioned that in the old days, you know, the guy sitting behind the wheel had to take over some 2% of the time. But like the ultimate goal of these companies for building self-driving cars is to replace that work entirely. But I think for most companies, like, well, like when Google have machine learning in their search results, um, when Airbnb tailor the environments they show you based on machine learning, um, like when the New York Times serves you the stories that they think you'll be interested in, like most of the successful applications of machine learning are about some kind of collaboration between human and machine. It's not just about replacing the human, it's about like how can we make the human better in some way. Um, and the kind of angle that, that we have here, or the, or the reason I think behind this is that machine learning, as I said at the start, is like super good at answering narrow questions. And often for, some, for many questions, you can get much better performance from a machine than you ever would from a human. But they're only good at the one thing. Like they're terrible. Like if I take my self-driving car, I show it a chessboard, like it's not going to learn magically to play chess. But that's something humans are great at. Like if I play a new game, like you know I've never played it before, but I can very quickly like transfer concepts from other games that I've played. Um, I can like bring in knowledge even from like non-game context and synthesize that together and make new decisions and learn new policies. Um, and that's kind of like the gap that hasn't been bridged. Like AI is really good at, machine learning is really good at single things, but it's not good at learning to be a general purpose agent. Um, and like Google have been releasing some papers about like uh, algorithms that share context from different tasks. And they're trying to like work very slowly towards this like general purpose learner. That's, that's the goal, like, you know, a, a real AI, kind of HAL, Skynet, <laughs> kind of the scary AI. But I don't think in the short term that that's where the value is going to be. Like, the question is like, why not just use both? Like humans are good at one thing, machines are good at another thing. Why not just build services so that the machine can support the human to be the best that they can at some task. And I think this is like the big direction where people are going. And it's, I think the technique is kind of broadly called intelligence augmentation. And it's this idea that you know, the machine supports the human, holds them up, lifts them up, makes them better at something than they would otherwise be. So Google search is the classic example. Like it makes you better at searching documents, at finding knowledge. Spotify have this Discover Weekly playlist um, that you know, gives you new music every week based on your, your tastes. And um, that makes you better at finding music. And all those voice assistants that I talked about, they make you better at a bunch of small stuff, you know, like finding recipes while you're cooking or um, turning on the lights, like doing all these like small tasks that you can do on your own, but they kind of support you and enhance your ability to do a bunch of different stuff. So I think that's the direction that this is gonna go at least in the short term. Maybe one day someone comes up with a general AI, but I don't see it happening in my lifetime. So I think this is kind of what we're stuck with. So the question then you have to ask is, how do we build these things? And I think the, same, the answer is the same way you build any good piece of software. Like, you have to collaborate. Like, you can't just have you know, a bunch of machine learning nerds in a basement doing math. Like, that's not gonna get anything done. Um, like building any piece of software is about collaboration between design, between engineering. And now that we throw machine learning in the mix, like nothing changes. It's all about having this end to end kind of collaborative process um, where the, this stuff comes together and you can produce good services. And machine learning is just a tool that solves one of the problems that the, serv the users of the service face. And I want to kind of close on a, a kind of a cautionary tale. What happens when you leave? certain parts of this collaboration out. So in 2015, uh, Google rolled out this feature in, in Google Photos uh, where they would automatically tag objects in the images and then you could search your Google Photos, say I want to find pictures of buildings or pictures of dogs and it would try and find as many photos in your library that matched the thing you searched for. 
day one, they roll out the feature. This is what happens. It starts tagging certain people of color as gorillas. And like, that's super bad, right? Like, this was terrible for their PR. And like, the reason this happened is because the data that they were training their system on just didn't have enough people of color in it. Like, it was collected and analyzed and curated by a bunch of like primarily white software engineers somewhere in a basement in Mountain View. And the data weren't diverse and machine learning can't like magically do stuff. It just learns to repeat what's there. So if there's bias in the data, there's bias in the output. And this is exactly what happened. And like if a designer had actually sat down and thought through like what are all the things that could go wrong with this application, you know, this could have been present prevented. They could have had some sanity checks in here like, okay, let's go through all these faces and figure out, you know, are there any like really catastrophically bad mistaggings? But no one did that. They shipped the feature, and then like a few days later, the gorillas tag was quietly removed, eh? and you can no longer search Google Photos for gorillas. Um, so that's more or less what I've got to say. Um, I've said a bunch of stuff. This is, talk is in some ways kind of a, a knowledge dump. So let's try and like, if you remember any three things that I said. These are the things I think you should remember. The first thing is that machine learning is a tool. Like, it doesn't magically come along and solve your business problems. It doesn't replace design. It's all about finding problems that are worth solving. And then, if machine learning is a good fit, then go for it. Like, it can be extremely powerful, but it's not a general purpose patch. Find the problems first. To find those problems, look for situations where the rules are complex, but it's easy to get examples because if those things aren't true, then there's no point in using machine learning. And the last thing uh, is that when you try to set out to solve these problems, you should design for supporting and enhancing human capabilities because we don't have general AI yet and um, we need to bring this kind of collaboration between human and machine to create like really great digital services using this stuff. And that is it. Thank you very much for listening.